Welcome to the Sideline Sports Podcast. I am the host, Alex Naveja, and if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. Welcome to another edition of Sideline Sports Podcast. I am the host, Alex Naveja, and where if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. Apologies that I wasn't able to have an episode last week, a very crazy, very hectic week it was for the household here. But you know what? We've got a great special guest for you guys to make up for that last week that I missed out on. We have the play-by-play broadcaster for the High A Arizona Diamondbacks affiliate, the Visalia Rawhide. And they're also the Cal League 2019 champions. We have Jill Guerin. Jill, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. I'm excited to do this. I'm just as excited as well, Jill. You have a very exciting history while I was doing some history and doing some research on a little bit about you, Jill. But you know what? Before we get started on a little bit about you, I wanted to talk a little bit about everything that's going on right now with Major League Baseball and also in Minor League Baseball where it's getting a little tough between the Players Association and with the league that they can't seem to find that agreement on whether to have 50 games, 82 games, or or 100 plus games. And what are your thoughts on that right now? Because also minor league baseball can't even get started as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't have, it's tough because I'm I'm only 23. I've only been in (laughs) baseball for really two seasons. One of them was as an intern with the Red Sox, and this is my first season. Um, as a full-time play-by-play broadcaster. So I don't have a full grasp of the business of baseball, of the negotiations that tend to happen. This is my first time kind of experiencing this. So I'm just trying to take it all in and learn as much as I can for, you know, the future negotiations that happen so I can kind of see the tell signs and whatnot. But, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed in how it's happening. I don't know who to point the blame on I don't know if you can point it on just one group but it's disappointing and it's affecting minor league baseball in particular because we are in a limbo where we tend to have to wait for major league baseball to make decisions before we can then react to it so obviously a majority of the country is focusing on what's happening with major league baseball but to me I just kind of want them to figure it out I don't even I do care what they decide, but partially I'm like, I don't care what you decide, just figure it out so that way minor league baseball can figure it out. Absolutely. I mean, all of us are just dreading and just hoping and wishing every day, hey, is baseball coming in? Oh, no. Okay, is baseball coming in? Oh, I guess not again today. So we're going to keep continuously being patient. Jill, I know you want baseball just as much as I do, so we're going to have to just wait and see for that one. But now let's talk a little bit about you, Jill. You graduated from Emerson College and you graduated with your bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism. So uh, talk to us a little bit about your times there with Emerson. Yeah, so I went to Emerson. That's in downtown Boston. I was super happy with my decision to go there. Um, A big part of it for me was I knew I wanted to go into broadcasting And I have family out on the East Coast that happened to be visiting Boston and kind of thinking about schools and whatnot, where I'd want to go. And I just so happened to find out about Emerson actually from an actress at the Boston Tea Party Museum. And she mentioned, oh, Emerson has a really good journalism program. And I looked into it more and I said, oh, I could play softball there too. It'd be awesome living in Boston. And the rest kind of went from there where I had my... Um, official visit and whatnot and yeah started there in 2014 graduated in 2018 with a bachelor in a bachelor's degree in journalism with an emphasis in broadcast minored in sports communications and had a emphasis in marketing so I had a great time there Um, I loved playing softball for the Lions and I'm so happy with my decision to go there so not only were you the athlete, but you even also got to cover the athletes as well. And I mean, after you graduated from Emerson, you even got to cover the Boston Red Sox. And, you know, doing a little bit of background, it 
I found a little story that was talking about how when you were little, you said that you wanted to be in the booth and even broadcast for the Boston Red Sox. And look at you. You, you got to cover the Boston Red Sox. And it ended up being when they won against the Dodgers. I'm still a little hurt from that one myself, Jill. So, <laughs> so you got that privilege. You got that opportunity. Please tell us for the viewers that don't know and even know what that feels like to even work for that team you've always wanted to broadcast for. Yeah, I mean, so grew up a Red Sox fan. Again, I have family from the Boston area. My dad's from Lawrence, Massachusetts. And I grew up a Red Sox fan. I said during my eighth grade graduation speech, I'm going to be the broadcaster for the Boston Red Sox. And, you know, of course, everyone's laughing. Here's this 13-year-old girl saying she's going to do that. But, I mean, eight years later, I ended up being in the radio booth with Tim Neverett and Joe Castiglione. And I was helping them, not exactly helping them broadcast the games, but I was giving them statistics. So, I was the booth statistician intern, and what I did was before games, I would be in the clubhouse gathering sound for the post-game or pre-game show, um, getting any information I could for Joe or Tim. I would start writing notes, reading as much as I could about that matchup, that game, everything going on, and then, then during the game, whenever something interesting happens or I had a note to give them, whether it was a statistic or a story, I'd hand them a post-it card with that on there so it helped enhance the broadcast a little bit at least i hope it did and then after the game i did the same thing went into the clubhouse interviewed players gathered sound for the post game show or for the pre-game show the next day and i mean it was a lot of fun there's so much history and fenway and to just think about all the amazing players amazing amazing broadcasters reporters who have been in that clubhouse it was so cool to think about and, yeah, like you said, I made it. That's, I mean, I didn't make it as a broadcaster, but I, I completed my, my dream. My dream when I was 13 was to cover the Red Sox, and it was, it was awesome that I got to do that. And, you know, the cherry on top was I got to cover a World Series championship team. Not many people get to say that they did that. So, I mean, I'm super fortunate and lucky to be where I am at just 23. Oh, absolutely. To be 23 and to be able to already accomplish that and be a part of a World Series team, I already feel like you've already accomplished a lot in life right there, Jill. Already big time plans right there. But what kind of people did you get to meet and as far as like, what were the experiences like being up there in the booth? Yes, I mean, it, it was great. So first of all, I got the internship because of Tim Neverett. He actually graduated from Emerson College. Um, I think it was back in 88. He's going to kill me if I got the year wrong and I call him <laughs> older than he is. But I think it was in um, 88 he graduated and he wanted this internship to be specifically for Emerson students. So it was myself and Matt Kutcher. We split off um, home games covering and helping them for the Red Sox. And, I mean, I got to meet some amazing people, whether it was beat reporters, um you know, sports reporters for the local TV station. Uh, the other broadcasters were the big part for me that I wanted to meet them, especially the women. So Jessica Mendoza, I fangirled so hard when I met <laughs> Jess <laughs> just because I grew up watching her play softball and she was such an icon to me. So definitely fangirled when I met her and Susan Waldman with the Yankees. I mean, again, both are just legends and I just look up to them for um, how much they have to deal with and how they really did blaze the trail for me and have made it easier for me to do what I do. All right, you talked a little bit about fangirling Jessica and also Susan. What were your first reactions? Because they, they definitely made the trip over to Fenway. So what were your first reactions meeting her? Um, so Tim, made, Tim always told me, if you want to meet someone, let me know. And I told him, Susan and Jessica, like, those are my two. And so when he said, okay, let me grab Jess for you. And, I mean, I'm talking butterflies in my stomach, like sweaty <laughs> palms. I had to shake her hands. I'm like, oh, God, she's going to think I'm a spaz because I'm sweating so much. But she was just so nice and so down to earth. And her and I still correspond a little bit um, through emails and stuff and keep in touch. And she was just so amazing. And 
the fact that we were able to talk about softball and talk about her experience of that and how she was able to incorporate playing softball into her broadcasting and how maybe I can try to do that. Obviously, I'm not an Olympian. I played D3 softball, so it's not the same, but I can maybe incorporate um, things just like she did. So it, it was just really cool to talk to her about all of that. How about with uh, Susan? Did you get the opportunity to meet her as well? Yeah, so Susan, I got to meet her kind of briefly. She was kind of running all over the place. Um, so what, I initially met Susan, and I wasn't scheduled to work that day, but I told him, I want to meet Susan, and it was the first time she was going to be in town. And he said, yeah, I'll just go ahead and come, and you can hang out for the game, and I'll make sure that you meet her. And it was she had to run to do her pregame show. We met briefly, and I made sure to come back and talk to her the next series that she was in town. And um, she just gave me great advice, and I was able to – I mean, she's been doing it for so long that – She's, I just wanted to absorb all the wisdom possible from her. And she gave me great advice about how to interact with the players and how to use being a woman to my advantage. And the best, I think the highlight of my internship was I found out I got the job with the Rawhide in October. And that happened to be during the ALCS, Red Sox versus Yankees, both Jessica and Susan were covering um, one for ESPN Radio, Susan obviously for the Yankees, and I got to tell both of them that I got a job as a minor league baseball broadcaster, and they both gave me the biggest hug ever and congratulated me. And, you know, they were excited not only for my career, but there's another woman that they can add to the list of broadcasters because it's not that long of a list in baseball. So it was it was a special moment that I was able to share with the both of them. Wow, that's big time there, Jill. Just to be able to, first of all, you graduate from Emerson, you received that internship opportunity with the Red Sox, and after receiving that professional experience inside of a professional broadcast booth, learning from some great mentors, you get the job with the Rawhide. That is that is pretty big time. Before we talk a little bit about the, the Rawhide job, I just wanted to, to say, what would be some tips and some pointers that you'd give? Whenever you meet someone, don't hesitate to ask if they can help you, to ask if you can keep in touch with them, and don't just use that connection to further your career, but check in with them. Check in to see how they're doing, how they're doing with this pandemic, with baseball being on hold. Check in with them that way. So long answer of what my advice. So definitely focus on your networking. Well, advice taken, Jill. I would definitely take note of all the advice that you have given me. But we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Jill's first season with the Vice Sally Rawhide, how that went, and how she made history in minor league baseball. Where if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. We'll be right back. This is Jacob Huey, first baseman for the Long Beach State Dirtbags, and you're watching Sideline Sports Podcast. Welcome back to Sideline Sports Podcast. I'm the host, Alex Naveka, and with me today, again, is Jill Gearing, the play-by-play -play broadcaster for the High A affiliate of the Arizona Diamondbacks, the 2019 Cal League champions, the Visalia Rawhide. First half, we were talking with Jill about her time with Emerson College, along with a little bit about what's going on with Major League and Minor League Baseball right now, and even with her experience with her internship with the Boston Red Sox and meeting a lot of her favorite broadcasters. And now, we want to know what it was like to broadcast. Now, you're in the minor leagues now. Now, you're the broadcaster. No statistician anymore. Now, you are the voice of the Visalia Rawhide. And you know what? To add a little bit of fun facts for everybody, Jill is actually the first woman Cal League broadcaster ever and the third female uh, woman broadcaster in minor league baseball history. So, first of all, before we even talk about the Visalia Rawhide, how did, like, when, when you accepted the job and you found out that information, what went through your mind? Yeah, I, when when I found out, when I was applying for jobs, I knew there weren't very many women, and I kind of knew 
um, of, that there were only two others, Emma Tiemann and um, Kirsten Carbot. And, like, it, 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 yeah, there's pride. I mean, great. I'm helping other young girls become a broadcaster, maybe trying to help them navigate it by blazing my own path. But, I mean, it, yeah, as much as I'm excited about that, it's more, what the heck? It's, it was 2019 when I took the job. How was there only three girls total that have ever done this? It, it, it was more just disbelief, disbelief. No, absolutely. I completely understand you. Now you're 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 defeating the odds, and now you're. I feel as though you're helping other women women into really getting into the industry now i feel like there are, are more women now going on to you see espn you see a lot more a lot more broadcasters not just on the reporting side now it's broadcasters and really opening up that spectrum to to women coming into the sports industry and you know it's a it's a really nice change to see that to be able to see just different broadcasters and different people offering what they can and to make it more diverse. Right. It, to me, I don't know if girls, young girls thought, oh, I can't do that because of gender norms and whatnot. But I think it was more they never thought that they could do that because they'd never seen many other women calling play-by-play. It was mainly sideline reporters and Guideline reporting is very difficult. I've done it before. Um, it, it's such a difficult job, but for some reason, a majority of women tend to go towards that career and play-by-play -play tends to stay male. And so with my hope, my hope is that with myself doing this and there's a few other women coming through soon and minors, I hope that there's just going to be more representation which then allows young girls to see that it is a possibility that they can go and do that. Because I do believe that when you see someone who sounds like you, that looks like you doing a certain job, you then believe that you can do it too. I agree with you, Jill. I've had my fair share of broadcasts where I've had, I've had a woman along my side. And you know what? We've actually clicked very nicely and we've actually put up some very great broadcasts. I mean, I've had some summer leagues where I've had I've had a, my friend, I remember my friend Kayla, she wanted to be on the broadcast and I invited her onto the broadcast booth, shared her baseball knowledge. And you know what? That that nine that nine inning game went by so quick. I said, "Wow, it's over already." So there's, I, I, I would wish that all women would just say, hey, you know what, I want to be in the booth as a broadcaster and nothing's going to stop me. So I absolutely agree with you there, Joe. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that there is a different perspective that women can bring and you just have to kind of wait and listen for the woman broadcaster to tell their story to tell the story of the game because I think there is a different perspective and it's great to have both and I'm excited that more women are going into this profession. Absolutely. Jill, you uh, you have lady luck on your side. First of all, to be a part of a championship team with the Boston Red Sox, now to be a part of a championship with the Visalia Rawhide. Tell us, now to be a part of two championship baseball teams it's just to be a part of that year how did that how did that make you feel and how did that first year as being the rawhide broadcaster go yeah i mean being a part of two championship teams was pretty awesome um there's no other way to describe it and you know 2019 definitely is much um more important in my heart um, despite growing up a Red Sox fan, it was great seeing that. Being a part of the 2019 Visalia team was so much fun to watch, just to see how many players came through. I think we had over 50 players at one point on the roster come through, and we had over 100 transactions. It was just a crazy year in terms of turnover, but they were always good. They were first-half champs second half champs and then the Cal League champs and there was a 14 game win streak in April and the Rawhide were the first 
minor league team to clinch a playoff spot, and that was on June 4th. I mean, that's unheard of. So it was it was just such a special season and a special group of guys. It was it was so much fun, and you know, and you know from broadcasting, it's a lot more fun to cover a team when they're winning. So they definitely made my life a lot easier by winning and being a good group of guys. But my first year was awesome. You know, there's definitely ups and downs with learning curves and getting used to a new team, new coaches, a new league, um, a new front office. So it definitely ups and downs, but it was it was awesome. I look back so fondly, and it makes me miss baseball a lot. It definitely makes you miss sports and miss baseball just a little more. Now, <laughs> for those of us that don't know as well, what were your – what was – the day life going into the office and what was a normal day looking like for you? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's crazy. A, a home game is insane. So, you know, I'm the play-by-play -play broadcaster, but my official title is the Director of Broadcasting and Media Relations Manager. And with that comes a lot of other things. So I'd usually be at the ballpark by 9 a.m. Um, I would start with writing my game notes, um, those are notes that I prepare for myself, and I also give them to the visiting broadcaster and any other media personnel that um, happen to be covering that game. So that takes probably, depending on how focused I am, two to three hours. Um, and then I print off about 15 copies of those. The next big part is the stat packs, and luckily minor league baseball gives you access to all of the statistics that you could ever want, and it organizes them really well. So I just have to pick the ones that I want and print those off. And again, those are for myself, the visiting broadcaster, other media personnel, and the coaching staff for both teams. So usually by one o'clock, I have all of my paperwork done um, with that stuff and it's all delivered to the coaching staff and um, to the press box. We usually have a day of game meeting with the entire front office. That's usually around one or two. Um, maybe even a little bit earlier, depending on the day. Um, but that's just kind of going over promotions that are going on that day and making sure everyone's on the same page. I usually um, don't need to know too much about it because I am stuck in the booth during the game, but it's still nice to be a part of the front office and know what's going on so you can help out if needed. Um, by 3 o'clock, I try to be out of the office and out on the field. I play... Um, the music during BP and during field work, um, my intern, Hannah Wright, she created those for me, and I play those um, starting then. I am usually try to be on the field the entire time unless something comes up that I need to go handle, but I'll be around the players asking them in um, set one-on-one -on -one interviews, also just asking them questions for good stories during the games, um, and then usually by... Six o'clock, I'm in the booth. I have whatever concession stand food I was able to grab, and I'm um, eating that while filling out my book. Um, I try to have the book filled out a little bit earlier, but, you know, it, it really depends. But usually by 6.30, I try to have the book done, notes done, everything set to go. Um, some other things that I have to deal with are social media, handling any um, press that comes through, helping with any clients that I have because I also do sales. Um, for the most part, that's it. I might be missing something, but that's the majority of my day. And again, I tried to give you a timeline for it, but it tends to end up being all over the place where I'm running around a lot. <laughs> Hey, it's oh, and then I broadcast the game, of course. I forgot. I forgot about the actual fun part of my job. By 7 o'clock, you know, I'm broadcasting the <laughs> game. Um, and, you know, you that's what you prepare for all day, the three-hour, three-and-a-half-hour broadcast. And after that, I go get the box score from the official scorekeeper, bring it into the um, home manager's office and the visiting manager's office make sure that they're all set with the box or that there's no issues there. And then I go write my post-game recap, post it online and on social media, maybe do a little bit extra work if needed, and then I'm out of the ballpark by 11 or midnight. Well, it's a long day, Joe, but I can only imagine how much you enjoy doing that on, a, on an everyday basis. 
Now, wanted to ask you, what, what is the thing that excites you the most about being that broadcaster for the Rawhide? Most exciting part? I mean, getting to tell these players stories. These guys are so amazing. They, some of them go through so much um, in their personal lives or on the field even they go through a lot just from what they're working through. If they're in a slump, if they're not able to throw a certain pitch properly, that kind of thing, it can be difficult. So being able to tell their story to our fans and our listeners and to be honest, the majority of the listeners are their, the players, families, friends, wives, girlfriends, and you want to do their stories justice and you want to give them a good game to listen to. So it's a combination of learning their stories and then telling their stories and trying to do it justice. The storytelling aspect is always the funnest part when it comes down to broadcasting and really getting to know your team, the coaching staff, the managers, and, and everything. It's always nice to inform the listeners and let them know about the teams that are on the field, not just telling them, oh, he bats 304 with this many home runs and this many RBIs. It's nice to know, like, hey, he came from... He came from this part of Mexico and he had to come up from a very struggling family and just talking about those type of stories are always exciting in baseball. My final question to you, Jill, is what is something that you like to improve on for the next season and hoping, you know, it's still crossing fingers that you can still even get maybe even half of the schedule of this season? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that I want to improve on. I think this first season was really just me trying to get my feet planted on the ground because there was just so many new things for me. Um, this one I really want to, I mean, again, there's so much. I think just as, as basic as it is, just give a better broadcast. I think I now know what it is I need to work on. Last year, I just tried to get the games up and give a decent play-by-play -play and do my best. And now, I've had critique from um, MLB broadcasters, from other broadcasters in the minors, from some of my mentors. I've had them listen to my reel, and they'll critique me. And I have a laundry list of things that I want to work on, and I'll take it right down the list, try to work on one once I think that that one's pretty um, muscle memory, that I do it pretty naturally. I'll cross that one off and go on to the next one. Um, another thing I want to work on is my stand-up in terms of pre-game, post-game interviews, giving information to the fans on social media and on the video board because what's new this season for the Rawhide is we're getting a video board in left center field. So that gives me a great opportunity to work on my stand-ups and my camera work because that is something I'm interested in pursuing. I'm interested in going into the TV side of play-by-play -play and also I want to be as versatile as possible and be able to do sideline if needed too. I'm looking forward to seeing that video board over at left field. That's going to be a really nice addition. And also looking forward to seeing those stand-ups on Twitter, on the Visalia Rawhide Twitter page. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that content. And you know what? I'll even throw on some Visalia Rawhide baseball on the radio to be able to listen to a little bit of it um, from here. Yeah, definitely. Please check us out. You know, we're... Um, Visalia Rawhide on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, pretty easy to find us. We have a YouTube page now, too, and, you know, unfortunately, it's kind of on, on hold right now, but we're still getting content up there. Um, I'm running the social media right now, so we're, we're just trying to keep our fans engaged, and I hope that you and whoever's listening will take a look. Well, Jill, we're unfortunately out of time here for Sideline Sports Podcast, but you know what? Thank you so much for coming on to the episode. I will make sure to put your social media handles along with the Visalia Rawhide social media handles down in the description below so that way everybody can know where they can find their Rawhide content along where they can find their broadcaster as well. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Alex. This is a lot of fun. And for anyone listening, if they have any questions about broadcasting the Rawhide, feel free to DM me. My DMs are open. 
Absolutely. We'll make sure to put the social medias down in the description below. And of course, if you guys enjoyed this content today, make sure to give this video a thumbs up. And if you're also enjoying the guests like Jill Gearin, make sure to hit the subscribe button because Jill is only the beginning of the many great guests that we're going to have on the podcast. And make sure to hit the notification bell as well. And of course, I was the host, Alex Naveka, and with me today again was the high A minor league broadcaster for the Arizona Diamondbacks affiliate by Sally Rawhide in Jill Gearin. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a good day, everybody. And of course, make sure to stay safe.